Good morning. Welcome to church. It's great to have you with us today, and you are so welcome. And a very warm welcome, especially if you are a dad. So well done to the dads on Father's Day. And in celebration of Father's Day, we have a gift for all of the men in church. So if you're a man, you get a gift today on Father's Day because on Mother and Sunday, all the women get a gift. So on Father's Day, all the men here at South First did get a gift. So kids, this is the deal here. During the singing of this first song, I want you kids to help make sure that all of the men, whether they happen to be your dads or not, get one of these gifts in this box, okay? So it's one gift per bloke in the church. Kids, help me to do that, please, as we sing our first song, Let's Stand to Sing. Father, we thank you so much that you are an amazing, generous God. And thank you that you can be our Father. So whether we have a good experience of an earthly father or a not so good one, thank you that you are the perfect Father to all of us. Thank you for the privilege that we have to meet together this morning in freedom and without fear. Thank you for one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing. <laughs> stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whispers of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never
seated you know it's always good when we meet together to say sorry to God our good father for not loving him with all of our heart soul strength and mind for not loving our neighbors as ourselves so let's join together in these words Lord God we have sinned against you we have done evil in your sight we are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoings and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, thank you so much that you loved us so much that you gave us the most precious thing you have, which is your Son. And we thank you that Jesus has paid in full the debt that we owe. So that we can be your children. Amen. Well, let's watch a little video now about Father's Day. Father's Day is a day to celebrate our dads and say a big thank you for all they do. For their love, hard work, wisdom, and support. 
for walking with us through the highs and lows. For being there through the tears and big steps and struggles and sorrows and joys and laughter. But for some of us, Father's Day is a hard day, a sad day. Some of us had dads who didn't look after us well. Some of us are remembering dads who are no longer here or children we have lost. Our relationships might be complicated, strained or broken. But whatever our earthly fathers are like, our Heavenly Father is far greater, far more dependable and far more loving. God the Father sent God the Son into the world to bring his children home and adopt us into his family forever. <coughs> Even the cost of his son's life wasn't too high a price to pay for his loved ones. So we can say thank you to our dads for all the ways, big and small, seen and unseen, that they reflect our Heavenly Father, the best father ever. Father's Day is yeah. Terrific. Well, we're doing things slightly differently now, experimenting, which means that the children and young people that are not going to stay in the service, and you're very welcome to stay in the service if you like to, but if you're going to go to Sunday Club, you're going to go during the beginning of this next song. So you don't have to wait till the songs are finished. You can just go. <laughs> but with Annette, so make sure that Annette's with you as you do that. So... Oh, no, 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 we're not going to do that. We're going to sing once more before you do go. So don't go just yet, and then you can go. That's what we'll do. So we're learning in, in Sunday Gang a new song called W-I-S-D-O-M. There are actions, they're never compulsory here at South Burstead, if you'd like to join in the actions. So do stand up. This is our new song for Sunday Club, as uh, true Sunday Gang. Um, it's because the theme this term is all about wisdom. Join in if you like. There is something that's better than the latest toy. There is something that never can be destroyed. It's worth more than toys.
fantastic. Give yourselves a round of applause. And the uh, turn around, greet somebody you don't know, find out how they take their coffee after the service, find out if they're doing anything exciting for Father's Day as the kids leave us that are going to Sunday Gang. So, Sunday Club. Getting a little confused. <laughs> so. Well, do continue your conversations afterwards. We're going to sing together. If you're a visitor, it's great to have you with us and you're joining us in a series called Love Your Church. And as a 
Church family, we're reading a book by Tony Morita called Love Your Church. And we're on week four, we're thinking about caring. And we're following this up in small groups. And it's not too late to be part of a small group, either meeting physically in the daytime or in the evening, or maybe even online. And those groups have a little trailer. So we've been sometimes looking at the trailer now to sort of have a little heads up for what to think about in preparation for those small group occasions, as we really want to help one another apply God's word and not just leave it behind in Sundays, but take it with us during the week. So there are some notes in the back of the book to help us do that, but let's watch a little video to help us as well. One of the most remarked upon aspects of the early church was how they cared for one another. I wonder if someone spied on your church today, would they remark about the same thing? I fear that there are many churches where they would say instead, behold how they criticize one another. Behold how they gossip about one another. Behold how polite but not authentically caring they are toward one another. There are many passages in which the New Testament uses the phrase one another demonstrating the importance of caring for our brothers and sisters in our Christian community. We're called to love one another, instruct one another, serve one another, submit to one another, bear one another's burdens, outdo one another in showing honor, bear with one another in love, encourage one another, show hospitality to one another. The list goes on and on. And it's no accident that in his letter to the Galatians, Paul moves straight from the discussion on the fruit of the Spirit to talking about church caregiving. The spirit-filled life is not so much about dramatic miracles or mystical experiences as it is about faithful Christians living in joyful devotion to Christ and to one another. The fruit of the spirit is displayed through familial care. In a moment, you'll have some time to discuss Galatians 6, but before you do that, let me outline five ways in which Paul says that we are to care for one another. First, in verse one, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. We are a family and we care for one another spiritually. Those who fall need a brother or sister to do the ministry of restoration. Second, Paul tells us to bear one another's burdens. Here is a daily mission for all of us. Be alert to the burdens of others and commit to making them lighter. It's not just for pastors, it's for every church member. Thirdly, Paul focuses on our responsibility to give material support to those who teach us. Paul knows that the gospel will spread through the steady proclamation of the word of God by faithful teachers. These teachers would be limited if they had to do other work in order to earn enough money to live. Fourth, Paul speaks about pursuing holiness. He says, the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. The books you read, the people you're with, the things you do for entertainment. These are all acts of sowing. Are they of the flesh or are they of the spirit? Do they lead you into sin or do they lead you away from it? We need to sow to the spirit if we want to reap holiness. Lastly, Paul encourages us to not grow weary in doing good. Keep loving one another. Keep resisting bickering with others. Keep rejecting false teachers. Keep bearing one another's burdens. Here is another daily mission for us all, to look for opportunities to bless others by doing good. This will not happen by accident. It's something we have to do intentionally. I hope that in your discussion time, you'll be able to think about at least one thing each of you could do this week to put this principle of caring into practice. Why don't you pray before you start this discussion? So do please turn to Galatians chapter 5. It's on page 1172 of our church Bibles, 1172. Galatians chapter 5, beginning at verse 16, 1172.
Galatians 5, 16. So, I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfil the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something, when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions, then they can take pride in themselves alone, without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Father God, thank you so much that you are a speaking God. Please would your Holy Spirit now be our teacher and our guide. 
Please, with your glory, be our chief concern. Please help me to neither go beyond your word, nor to fall short of it. In Jesus' name, amen. John Stott helpfully said that if you sow your wild oats, don't expect a harvest of strawberries. We have in front of us today a part of a letter from Paul to the church in Galatia, to the Galatian Christians. And there are some agricultural sort of metaphors here. Now, I'm not very good at gardening, but I do understand this basic idea that if you were to sow one particular crop, that is going to be the crop that you're going to then harvest. And elsewhere in the Bible, there are also some other instructions around this whole idea of sowing. If you're going to sow, you can sow good seeds, sow it in good soil, make sure it's well watered. And also, be patient. Because the harvest often takes a little while. So don't keep on picking up the plant to see how it's getting on and then be discouraged and disappointed that it's not growing as quickly as you'd like it to. There is some patience that are necessary before you get to harvest time to see that crop grow. And similarly, in our Christian lives, we also have to sometimes exercise a little bit of patience to see the fruit of what God is doing in us as his Holy Spirit is our leader and takes control of more and more of our lives and we submit to him and his ways. And as we seek to please him in what we do. Now, it was Pentecost a couple of weeks ago, and it's terrific to celebrate in this Pentecost season the ministry and the work of the Holy Spirit. And what we have here at the end of chapter 5 is Paul instructing these Galatian Christians about the fruit of the Spirit. What is the outcome of being Spirit-filled Christians? I was chatting to somebody the other day and they told me that they weren't coming to this church anymore, they were going to another one down the road because they were all about the Holy Spirit whereas we were not. And I, I did sort of point out that they, they, they did admit that we were all about Jesus and I said, well, the thing is, is that the Holy Spirit is all about Jesus. The Holy Spirit is all about spotlighting Jesus, doesn't draw attention to himself. We want to point to Jesus just like the Holy Spirit does. And what we see here in this passage is what a spirit-filled believer looks like. See, should it be our priority to want to have all sorts of personal experiences of the Holy Spirit's activity? so that it's all about us. So it's about our gifts of what we can then do to connect with him. Or it's about us having a, a liver shiver or a particular type of experience. I don't think so, according to this passage. It seems to me as though the emphasis here is that the, the spirit-filled believers are all about blessing and caring for other people. It's about ministry that seeks to transform and make a difference to other people. So the attention is not all about me and my experience. And that is what we see here is a great hallmark of the spirit-filled believers. Now, I, I, I was going to use a visual aid, but I seem to have left it behind. But I'll describe it to you. You'll have to use your imaginations. Imagine that I had here a glove. And 
we kind of sometimes do this with the kids. It's probably why I probably deliberately left it behind. <laughs> but, but anyway, um, another day we might do it with the kids. And if I was to instruct the glove and say to the glove, glove, point. The glove is just dead and lifeless and sits there on the table. If I were to say to the glove, glove, pick up the coffee cup. The glove just sits there, dead, not able to do anything. If I was to say, glove, wave, <laughs> it can't do anything. If, however, I was to put my living hand into the glove and say to the glove, point, it would be able to point, it would be able to pick up the coffee cup, it would be able to wave. We are dead until we are filled with the Holy Spirit and made alive. So no wonder we are unable to bless others and please and serve God if we are lifeless and we don't have the Holy Spirit's activity and work in us. Pleasing him and doing what he wants in his strength and power. And what it seems here is he, what he wants us to do is to care for others. I've mentioned before about Simeon Stylites. And Simeon Stylites was apparently somebody who lived in the 5th century in Syria, near Aleppo, and this guy thought he was very spiritual and holy. It's interesting, isn't it, how people describe now being spiritual as something that kind of is acceptable in our society. I, I saw a play the other day in Chichester Cathedral. I am still quite in shock about the play, so uh, I'm not quite sure what I think of it. But uh, there was a bit in it where somebody said, oh, of course, I'm not religious, but I am spiritual, and so forth. And that seems to be very acceptable and trendy uh, in some quarters. And this person thought he was spiritual, Simeon Stylites, and he was called Stylites. You know how a stylus is, do you remember styluses on record players? Do you remember such a thing as record players, where little, you had to change the stylus every so often? It's like a little needle thing. Well, this guy, Simeon Stylites, he, he stood uh, for, by himself, just standing for quite a while. But people thought he was clever, so they came to ask him questions. But he didn't like that, so he built a pillar, like a <laughs> to stand on. And, and they still kind of like asked him things, so he decided he didn't like that. So he built this sort of 60-foot pillar <laughs> so that people couldn't get to him. Built a wall around it. Apparently, he didn't come down for 37 years. He, and and he, that's, this was considered to be the sort of the pinnacle of spirituality. Apparently, even when his mother died, they had to reroute the, the, the funeral procession around past the pillar because uh, he didn't want to come down for the funeral. That is not Christian spirituality. It's not about being separate from people. It's about rolling up your sleeves and getting involved. Now, I'm not saying there isn't a place for sometimes having some sort of retreat and quiet time and so forth, but not as a way of life. It's not about withdrawing into some sort of private monastic kind of experience. It's about getting involved and getting stuck in. So, the beginning of chapter 6 of Galatians. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, and that will happen, because we will all continue to sin right up until when the Lord Jesus returns. Or we die, whichever one comes first. Because we don't reach some sort of perfect state here on earth. We, we still 
have this bias in us towards sin, even though we've trusted in Christ and we're spirit-filled. <coughs> so Christians will continue to sin, and sometimes pretty spectacularly. And when that happens, if someone's caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit... Now, that isn't you, the vicar, you, the pastor teacher, you, the PCC, you, the elders. It's you who live by the Spirit. That's all and any and every Christian person. That isn't like a special class of Christian. By definition, if you're a Christian, you're living by the Spirit. You should restore that person. Gently. Now I say gently, well it does say gently, which is, which is interesting, because apparently the way in which that word restore was used, one place in the New Testament it's used, where, which is of the disciples, you know how they were fish, some of them were fishermen, they, mend, they, mend, they were mending their nets, that word for mending their nets is the word for restore. That's the image of sort of bringing something that is broken back into wholeness. But that word was also used back in the day for what a physician would do to reset a bone. Now, I've never had to have that done, fortunately, but I can imagine it might be quite painful, <laughs> particularly if you can imagine without anaesthetic or I don't know how they do that nowadays to make it less painful, but I'm sure there is a sense in which, what do they say in the medical profession? This is going to hurt. So although, yes, we do it gently, there may well be a sense in which it will hurt in the short term because it's going to have to get, there's going to be some pain before it gets better. That is the nature of what it means when somebody is restored. They're, they're, it could be a little bit messy still. But we do it gently. So that's something for the church family. How brilliant to be part of a church family where that is part and parcel of what happens. That's the normal Christian life. So then it says, but watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Now that's interesting, isn't it? So we, we have to be careful about ourselves in this. Because we could end up being in the same mess that they're in, which is problematic. So we, the, we have to be self-aware of our own temptations. So in getting so close to the situation that we're trying to help this other person in, we also could end up being tempted. So we've got. To, so for some of us, it might be that we'll have to be particularly cautious about how and what boundaries we need to set up. It's all very well helping somebody else in, in, in some situations where they might be, have addictions and so forth, but actually we might end up being tempted in that same area, so we'd have to protect ourselves and be careful. I, <laughs> I used to work in an outdoor pursuit centre up in North Wales, and one January, I was asked if I would be a body in a canoe sea, seeing kayaking kind of like instructor exam, sort of examination or whatever it was, you know, a certificate in, for other people to be sea kayak instructors. So I, so I had to be in the water. It was January. It was chilly. I did wear a wetsuit. 
And so the person who was examining the process told me that what I had to do was everything I could to get the instructor who was supposedly rescuing me into the water <laughs> to capsize them. But what I didn't know was that the trainee instructors were told that what they needed to do was to make sure under no circumstances did they capsize and needed to be rescued as well as the person that they were rescuing. So, in, in which case, sometimes they may well go to what seemingly seemed, you know, quite drastic measures to prevent them from getting capsized. Because if they're in the water as well, they can't then, you can't then help the other person. So I, I did try to do this. So I, I was this body, I'm in the water, I'm kind of like pretending to, you know, need, and then I grabbed on to the person to try and tip them out of their canoe. And then he whacked me over the head with a paddle, which is what he was supposed to do, to stop me from doing that, to save himself. You have to be cruel to be kind sometimes. It's a bit like in the, in the aeroplanes, isn't it, when they say that you put on your own gas mask, you know, oxygen mask first before you start helping other people because otherwise you might get into the situation where you're no help to anybody else if you haven't got your own oxygen mask on. So, that could be a way, we need to be careful about not being tempted, but to, there may be another way. It might be that we just actually attempted to get all very judgy and proud. I'm never going to fall into that sin. Aren't I so wonderful? And actually, we've got to watch ourselves because whenever we point the finger, there are three pointing back at us. And it might be that actually we'll have to be careful about checking our own hearts and how we might be tempted in those situations. Verse 2, carry each other's burdens. And in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Now, you know, some burdens at some seasons of our life need somebody else to come alongside us to help us to carry them. Isn't that a brilliant thing about how a Christian community can operate? So there will be times when it might be a mental health issue, it might be a physical health issue, it might be a relational issue, it might be a, a financial or a work issue, it could be all sorts of things where somebody is under some sort of pressure, they are carrying a burden which they are struggling with alone and somebody else from their church family can come along and help share Verse 3, if anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Again, this is why I'm saying this could be all about that being the temptation to be kind of a bit proud and a bit puffed up, a bit arrogant. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone. Now, I think, hang on a second, Tim. Didn't you just say we're not supposed to like, take pride in ourselves. And now this is saying, but you can then take pride in yourselves alone. It does say though, without comparing themselves to someone else. You see, one of the great problems is that we can quickly get into gift envy. So every Christian believer is spirit-filled, and therefore every Christian believer 
has been given spiritual gifts. None of us have all the gifts. We don't get to choose which gifts that we have. So somebody else will be given gifts that you don't have. Don't be envious or jealous of someone else's gifts. Don't be thinking, if only I had their gifts, then I'd be able to serve. No, you are responsible for serving, not with the gifts you haven't been given, but the gifts that you have been. And I guarantee, if you're a Christian, you have been given at least one spiritual gift to use. And that is down to you. And then once you use them, there is a sense in which you can take pride in having done your job. Verse... For five, for each one should carry their own load. Now, each one can hang on, Tim. Paul was just saying that we're carrying each other's burdens. Now we've got to carry our own. Which is it? Make up your mind, Paul. Interestingly enough, the word load here is different from the word burdens earlier on. And they've translated them as different words because they were different words. And apparently, the burden word is a much kind of bigger issue. So it's a bit like when you see um, people going on holiday and they've got plenty of, you know, luggage. <laughs> you've got so much luggage that you, they can't literally carry it all themselves. It's going to be a shared kind of thing. They're going to need some help with that. Whereas, so that's the burden that you do need help with, but this carry your own load, that load word is more of like your own pack. You're like your own man bag or handbag or day pack. That one you are responsible to carry by yourself as opposed to having somebody else does that make sense? So the bigger one, you need help with. Your own one, carry it yourself. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. You know, for me, there is nothing better, nothing more encouraging than seeing other people using the gifts that God has given them and seeing them blossom and flourish and have wins for the kingdom. <laughs> that, for me, is having things shared with me, particularly if I'm on the receiving end of them, uh, when the fruit of word ministry that has seen other people then being equipped and enabled and trained to use their gifts. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. So, as I was just describing at the beginning, if you want potatoes, don't sow broccoli. If you want to sow a harvest, sorry, if you want to reap a harvest at the end, you've got to think in ahead of time what it is you're going to be sowing. So, this needs a little bit of thinking through. It is very logical, it is very simple. If we want to see some of these, the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, then don't expect that if you just veg in front of a screen and actually are pretty self-absorbed, that you're going to see a lot of fruit at the end of that and this harvest of spiritual fruit. It is that simple. 
Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So yes, of course, we could become weary. It is quite hard going. And sometimes we do need to stay, keep on keeping on. And what's interesting here, it says, therefore, as we have opportunity, again, we can't, not if we don't have the opportunity, but I can assure you there are plenty of opportunities for those who have the capacity. Not if you don't have the capacity, but if you do have the capacity, there are so many opportunities to do good to people here in South Burstead, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. So there is a right priority to the Christian community, to the household of faith, to your church family, to your brothers and sisters who belong to the same church. Yes, we do need to be doing good to all sorts of other people in this neighbourhood, in this locality. So it's absolutely right that we donate and volunteer to, to the food bank and serve and bless the neighbourhood. But especially the Christian family are to look after the Christian family. You know, the, one of the issues of the Christians in Galatia was that there were false teachers that were telling them that actually they, it was all very well Jesus dying on the cross, but they had to add to that with circumcision. Cross plus something else. For them, there was a particular issue with some people saying, well, if you're really spiritual, you know, like the Jews used to be circumcised, you would be circumcised as well, you Gentiles. You're not really the full deal because you've not been circumcised. And Paul is writing to help these Christians realise that that is such a heresy because what that is saying is that somehow or other what Jesus did on the cross wasn't enough. How offensive is that? If we try and add anything to the finished work of the cross, that is offensive. Any kind of religious practice. They had a kind of a pay-as-you-go type of religion. that it was, you had to sort of earn it and keep on paying for it. As opposed to receiving it and accepting it as a finished work that Jesus had done once and for all on the cross. And receiving his spirit to enable us and empower us to live lives that will please him. So we're not to get puffed up. We're not to get all judgy. We are to recognise that there by the grace of God go I. And we've got to get out, we've got to roll up our sleeves and help one another. Restore them. Not just for a few people, but that's something that we can share, a burden that needs to be shared and a load that needs to be shared. And yes, there is a sense in which that's not just saying to people, there, there, there. Just wallow in being a victim. Sometimes there is a tough love in that restoring, like resetting a bone. So it actually, over the long term, heals right. That's what caring God's way looks like. Let's not have self-abuse and self-harm in sowing to the flesh when, as we grow up in our Christian faith, we need to be sowing to the Spirit so that we reap a harvest of spiritual maturity. Let's pray. 
Father, we thank you so much that you are a loving and caring God. And we want to be like you in loving and caring. Out of the overflow of what we've received from you, we want your Holy Spirit, please, to empower us with gifts and fruit so that women and men and girls and boys who are struggling to carry their burdens can have their burdens shared by us helping in very real and tangible ways. We want to be those who are responsible for our own pack and load, but also can then, when it's appropriate, share caring others. Father, we also, some of us may need to be vulnerable and allow and present to others what burden it is that we have that needs some help with right now. So may we be able to do that also. May we be a caring community. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand to sing.
do please be seated for intercession. Let's come before our mighty God in prayer. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are able to meet together today in this building in the knowledge we can do this in safety and without fear of persecution. On this day when we celebrate fathers, we give thanks for them and we thank you that we can call you our Father in heaven. In Luke chapter 10 we read, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbour as yourself. We ask that we would be reminded of this daily. Help us, Lord, to demonstrate that love for you by loving one another, our brothers and sisters in Christ, and also the world around us, and that this love would be a beacon to our community. We thank you, Lord, for the love that you first showed us by sending your son Jesus to die on the cross so that the lost would be saved. Lord, we remember the conflicts that, we are, that are continuing around the world and pray that you would protect Christians in these places we particularly think of the war in the Ukraine and we lift up before you your church there. Would you strengthen them and uphold them in these terrible times and make them stand out to those around them? Lord, please bring an end to this war and other conflicts. We long for the day when the world can live in peace when you come again. We pray for our government, which has had to lead us through some difficult situations in the past couple of years. We ask that you give them the wisdom and strength to lead us in a way pleasing to you, with honesty and integrity. We think of those struggling at this time with rising prices coming from all directions. We pray that people would not despair, but would turn to you in their hour of need. Help us as Christians to be more aware of the needs of those around us. For our Christian brothers and sisters meeting today around the world to worship you, Lord, we ask that they would feel your presence as they come before you. In those places where it is dangerous to meet in your name, please afford them your protection so that they can praise you in safety. We would ask that you would soften the hearts of governments and dictatorships that persecute your people, just as you changed Saul on the road to Damascus, from one who was persecuting Christians to one who loved and wanted to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. We give thanks for our Queen, Elizabeth, for her faithful service over the last 70 years and for her love for you, Lord. We thank you that she is not afraid to speak of her faith and reliance on you. As she reaches her final years, we pray that her successor would also give their lives to you and bow down before you. We pray for our church here in South Burstead. We know that it's not about the building, but about the people meeting together in your name. And we ask for your blessing upon us. We pray that you would be with us as a church family, strengthening the bonds between us and protecting us from the work of the evil one. Lord, we ask for your blessing upon Jude Sunday Gang and ask that it would be a way of reaching out to younger families. We would love to see this work grow and draw younger people to join with us. Please give Tim and the team the stamina needed to maintain this work. And we bring before you all those in our congregation and those known to us who have needs at this time, both physical and spiritual. We pray that you would uphold them and draw near to them. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's join together in the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We're going to sing a final hymn today, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. Let's stand if you can. Let's join together in the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. You may get down. Coffee time.